You got zero at the table, man. All kinds of shit breaks through. Pick me, pick me. Zero's at the table, you gotta be careful. All kinds of shit breaks through, baby. Greetings, humans, and welcome back. I'm Joey Pigtails, and this is episode number 15 of my poker vlog called Double Board Bomb Pots, Don't Get Married to the Nuts. All the hands are bomb pots, and we're going to get philosophical on some of these and dive into some interesting decision points. Before I get into the vlog, I'm first going to be recapping some of my thoughts from the past week since I started putting in more hours at the tables. If you want to skip ahead to the hands, you'll find them here, but I hope you stay for the conversation. As I've mentioned before, one of my hobbies is collecting and playing card and board games, so the background you'll see here is me opening a booster box of the new Star Wars Unlimited CCG that just came out. Enjoy! So this past week I played a bunch of hours at Orange City and filmed over 50 bomb pods to get the hands for you today, so if you can appreciate the work put in, drop me a like. This week started off pretty well with a couple of small wins booked, followed by a pretty sweet sun run on Tuesday that saw me hit a steel wheel for the high hand and win a heads up all in pot with ace ace king 10 double suited versus the other two aces, so I was feeling pretty great after taking Wednesday off. Now one thing you should know before we talk about the rest of the week is that I haven't played a cash game on a Thursday in over a year. This is because last year, I lost the first six Thursdays I played, so I decided to stop doing that and use Thursdays as a day to get organized and also work on the vlog. And now we're here. I walked into Orange City around 2pm, optimistic and looking forward to breaking this Thursday losing streak. And I walked out of there a little after midnight, having not only missed that goal, but wondering exactly why I ever decided to test the will of the poker gods. To sum this session up, I had two separate hands, both worth $1,500 plus, where I was all in three ways on the turn with the nuts and lost. After seeing the other hands, I was 86% to win three ways on the first hand and 88% in the second. To say that I was demoralized after ending this session uh, is an understatement. I always go back to logic in these spots and try to remind myself that I win these the majority of the time and I didn't make any mistakes, but like we saw in vlog 14, it's hard not to be results oriented. My drive home from the room is about 30 minutes, so I had some time to think, but I didn't really want to at that point. I was filled with emotion and needed to release that energy, so I put on some loud music to distract me on the drive. I've talked before about properly relieving stress, and after getting home uh, after 1 a.m. and living through this nightmare session, I went out back. I stripped down, and I started jogging. Being old, I usually can't keep this up for more than a mile or so without taking a breather, but this time around, my thoughts and adrenaline took over, and I just kept going, and kept going. I managed to jog about three miles before I finally stopped. During this time I recounted this past session, I reflected on those big hands quite a bit, which of course included lamenting my misfortune like every other irrational human out there, but more so thinking about how these events impacted my play otherwise, and whether or not I was successful at battling tilt factors and continuing to play optimally. I did come to the conclusion that I made one huge mistake on the day, and that was not moving off of the main 1-2 game and getting back on the 2-5 must move. The must-move games in this room are always infinitely better action than the main games, so this mistake definitely played a factor here, if sort of indirectly. There is something to be said for unplugging from the world and just thinking. No electronics, minimal background noise, just you, your thoughts, the sounds of nature and the awkward slack, slapping of my gigantic feet on the pavement for a good hour. Taking this time was truly therapeutic. I managed to get a good night's sleep and wake up Friday afternoon ready to get into Orange City to find some semblance of redemption after uh, again paying the variance tax to the poker gods. How did my Friday session go? Oh, you'll see shortly. Let's just say it ended with a bang and you aren't going to want to miss it. Now let's get into the bomb pots. The first hand is a great lesson in reverse implied odds. Let's talk about it on the way. $15 per player. 8-handed, $120 in. I'm on the button and look down at 9 of hearts, 7 of hearts, 6 of spades, 2 of clubs. Not the best of hands, but whatever. 
With flops of King 10 8 2 spades and 9 8 8 2 diamonds, we see our hand interacts with both boards, although some of that equity is skeptical at best, with the, bottom, with the board pair on the bottom. Still, it's hard for anyone else to have the last combo of 9 9, and there are a couple 9 8s possible out there. As for the top board, we flopped a low end wrap, so let's see how this plays out. The small blind leads for 70, the big blind calls, and it's folded to the guy on my right that also calls. I've already discussed my hand's equity, now we look at pot odds. $330 in and $70 to call, with cards that can improve significantly on both boards. Calling is sort of mandatory here, I think, but I also think folding is okay, and while I didn't originally consider raising here, I don't think there is any fold equity given stack sizes being short, so maybe that is for the best. <clears throat> the turn on top is the queen of diamonds, and the bottom is the four of hearts. Our equity on top is toast, but we pick up some on the bottom as long as we aren't facing a boat there. When it's checked around to me, I check it back as well. Can a pot size bluff ever get through here? Let me know. The rivers are the queen of spades on top and the queen of hearts in the bottom. And I now have a nine high flush on that paired board and nothing on top. The small blind jams for 200 and we all end up folding. In hindsight, I should have just saved that $70 on the flop as the rep wrap equity we had on the top board was mostly to non nutted straights as the two remaining non spade sixes were my only nut outs. Food for thought. Here we go, a pretty good looking starting hand for a bomb pot. Ace, Jack, Jack, Seven with Nut Diamonds. We start this hand with about $500 from the big blind and see flops of 7, 4, 2, 2 diamonds on top and Queen, 4, 3, 2 clubs, 1 diamond on bottom. It's always nice to see a nut flush draw, but we don't like seeing a, a, an out gone on the other board. We also don't have much going for us on bottom, so we want to see a cheap turn. Now the player in the small blind bets $15 into 120, and this is both comical and scary as it is inviting a raise behind. I'm not folding here, so I call as does four other players, and we manage to fade a squeeze. <clears throat> With the 10 of diamonds on top, we drill the nuts there. The bottom board pairs the three of clubs, and we still don't have anything on that board. The player in the small blind now bets $10, and I can't help but chuckle at the small sizing. It's time to charge worse hands on my board and try to build a bigger pot to chop with whoever has the bottom board. So I raise it up to 125, looking to do those things, and I get two calls. Perhaps this was too much? The river on top is clean with the ace of spades, and the bottom board gets an ace of di or eight of diamonds. It's checked to me, I jam, and only one call means we chop this up. Note that I didn't pot the turn. We want as much multi-way action as possible here, so we want to bet enough to get multiple calls while also understanding we are going to get drawn out on some of the time as our nutted hand is vulnerable to board pairs. Ooh, another good looking hand in the cutoff. Ace, King, Queen, 10 with Queen High Clubs. With flops of King, Jack, Two, two hearts on top and ace six deuce rainbow on the bottom we flop pretty hard on one board and top top on the other with both boards sharing the bottom card and reducing the chances multiple people are strong on these boards i also have the dry ace of hearts and there's a heart on bottom so flush draws are less likely the player on my right who is sitting on about 300 dollars says i should bet but i'm gonna check so i go ahead and pot it for 105 and he's the only caller the turns are the jack of clubs on top and the three of spades on bottom, not ideal on either board. So in check two, I take the fold equity and put him all in, but he eventually makes the call. The rivers are the five of clubs on top and the ace of clubs on the bottom, and I roll over my hand. My opponent had flopped bottom two pair on the bottom board and king deuce on top, so I sucked out on both boards to scoop this one. From the small blind I look down at king jack ten five with jack high hearts. With 7 in, we see flops of ace 5 2, 2 spades, and 9 7 4, 2 spades. I've got a pair on top and a gut shot on the bottom while being out of position, so a check is in order, and it ends up getting checked around. The turn cards are the 3 of spades on top, bringing in the front door flush, and the 8 of clubs on the bottom, giving me the nuts straight there. Now, most of you are thinking this is a slam dunk bet here, but there are some things going on. 
Firstly, I'm sitting pretty deep right now, as are a few other players at the table. Yes, we have the nuts on that board, but this isn't the great opportunity it, appear it appears to be. Remember previous hands where we want were nutted on a board and wanted to get multi-way value? This is sort of the same thing, except my nutted hand can easily be shared with other players, resulting in potentially being quartered, if not outright losing this hand on the river. We don't have any significant equity versus any made hand on the top board, so the correct play is to check and evaluate. It's checked around to the cutoff, who bets $50, and we're not going anywhere for that price and make the call. It now folds over to Snake, who does a song and dance before enthusiastically potting it to $320 and flinging in a bunch of chips in. The player on my right folds, and I also end up making a fold here. <clears throat> Why, you might ask? For the reasons I mentioned earlier, it's highly likely I'm getting quartered here and may end up losing. If he only had $200, this is a call all day, but he has another $500 behind this bet. And it turns out I actually did make a bad fold. Uh, our opponent had nut spades, but nothing on the other board. Although like discussed, there are still four or five spades in the deck, and with the way I'm running, I'm sure it would come. I'll go ahead and pick another hand to battle with. Like maybe this one? We're eight-handed again, and I'm in the small blind with queen, ten, deuce, deuce, three clubs. Check this out. Pick me, daddy, pick me. Flopping quads, baby. Let's go. Two of hearts, two of diamonds, three of spades on top, and jack eight, five rainbow on the bottom, giving me a gutter and backdoor flush draw there, meaning I can potentially scoop this. This is a classic spot where we want to start building a pot, and we want to invite as many people as humanly possible into it. Being first to act, I snag two green chips and fire out such a bet. We see two calls before the cutoff now raises to 125. There isn't e ever any reason for me to re-raise here, so I call hoping everyone else does too. The player on my left obliges, and the other caller is all in for less. The turn on top is the... Wait. What the fuck? Tell me you're kidding me right now. The three of diamonds? Seriously? Well... Maybe all three players had equity on the bottom board? Hell, if anything, I probably picked up outs on the bottom if I did just get sucked out on. But let's not lose it yet. I go ahead and fire out 125 into the abyss for some reason I am never going to be able to explain at this point, and the other player on my left jams with the other player folding. I already know, just like Mike McD and Rounders, I don't need to see them turned over to know. I can fold, right? Nah. I convince myself that I have enough equity on the bottom board to call off, and end up bricking everything. Our opponent went perfect perfect on the turn, and he scoops this with quad threes on top and the nuts straight. Alright now, you're fucking with me, right? I told you not to fuck with me. Like, I keep finding myself at a loss for words here. This isn't the first time I've taken a one-outer like this. Hell. I've had it happen to me twice in an hour at a private game by my friend Corvette Nick, so this isn't new to me. But the timing of this just couldn't possibly be worse. I've talked about recently overcoming some issues and challenges to step back into this arena. I've worked hard to be physically and mentally fit to perform at a high level on this battlefield and make sound decisions, so why do I feel like I'm getting punished here? The proverbial variance bat is teeing off on my nutsack again, and I have to find a way to keep my head on and ride this wave of variance until it dumps me off in poker paradise, where my monster hands hold up, and I may even get to find a few of those come-from-behind winners for myself. <clears throat> I keep telling myself that this is just a set of iterations within the solver, and that the equalizing hands will be coming down the line at some point, because, you know math and karma and puppy dogs and jelly beans and stuff. I know in the end, if I keep making correct decisions, the end result will continue to be winning sessions and an upwards pointing graph, and I'm looking forward to reaping those rewards. In the meantime, I may actually end up down south at Hard Rock Hollywood this weekend for the $600, $2 million guarantee no limit hold'em tournament and maybe play some PLO cash games, or I may stay local and play the usual games. Either way, let's fucking go already. I'm hungry for some big wins here, and I've never felt better about my game. And even though this is another mental hurdle to overcome, I actually feel a bit motivated to get through this and emerge as the proverbial phoenix here. Thank you all for stopping by and sharing some time with me. 
It means a lot to have you lend your ears, and I hope I or someone else can do the same for you. I'm Joey Pigtails, and I am transparent, reminding you to be a good human. Bye!